Hi, I'm Dr. Jeff Grow, and this is Calculus One. Today, we're going to continue to explore limits. To refresh your memory about what we did last time, I'd like to pursue a particular example. Let's suppose f of x is equal to x squared when x is not 1, and 3 if x equals 1. The graph of this function looks like x squared most everywhere, except at x equals 1. At x equals 1, it outputs a height of 3. What is the limit as x goes to 1 of this function? Remember, when evaluating a limit, what happens at the point that you're tending towards is completely ignored. Instead, you look at what the y values tend to as the x values tend towards this point in the domain. In this case, whether you're going from the right or from the left, the y values tend towards 1. And so the limit as x goes to 1 of this particular function is 1. So what do we really mean by limit? Let's suppose we have some function. It might have a hole in it with a displaced point at x equals a. Let's suppose this is the limit value as you trend towards x equals a in the domain. And here is the function value. When it comes to limits, we're going to entirely ignore the function value because we don't care. All we want to know is what are the y values tending to as the x values tend towards a. So how do we actually define this? The idea is you choose some level of closeness. Let's suppose half the distance across this little interval around L is equal to something called epsilon. We'll let epsilon be as small as you choose, but positive. Then, there should exist some interval around A of radius delta and it too must be positive. And if you choose any x value inside of this delta uh, radius interval in the domain around A, the function value should be within the epsilon radius neighborhood of the limiting value L in the range. So if you stay close enough in the domain to A, the Y values will remain close enough to L in the range as long as we ignore what happens exactly at X equals A. Again, close in the domain implies close in the range to the lib value. Now let's formulate this precisely. What we've been saying is that for any epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that if the distance between the x value and a is two within delta units, you calculate the distance between real numbers by the absolute value of their difference. That has to be smaller than delta, but it must also be greater than zero. It has to be greater than zero because we do not want to look at x equals a. 
only at points no more than delta units away from A, but not A itself. We're specifically ignoring that value. If you stay within this level of closeness in the domain, then the function value will be within epsilon units from the limiting value. This measures a level of closeness in the range. Let me write that again, and we'll formalize this as our definition of limit. The limit as x tends to a of f of x is l is denoted, of course, by the limit as x goes to a of f of x equals l and defined by given any epsilon greater than zero that's your level of closeness in the range there exists some delta now this delta will depend upon the epsilon that you choose there exists a delta greater than zero such that If 0 is less than the absolute value of x minus a is less than delta, then the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. That's exactly what we mean by the limit of f of x going to l. This definition of limit was developed in the mid-19th century by the great mathematician Cauchy. This definition eliminated a lot of the problems with previous notions about limits that were introduced by people like Newton or Leibniz. Newton did not really understand limits. He had an intuitive way of arriving at limits. Unfortunately, his methods often led to paradoxes. So people knew it wasn't quite right. In order to gain the correct level of rigor that did not lead to paradoxes, required this definition right here. Let's do a simple example to begin with. Look at the limit as x goes to a of x. Well, if x is going to a, then x should go to a. Duh. Let's prove this. Let epsilon greater than zero be given. Now, we want the function value x minus a to be smaller than epsilon whenever zero is less than the absolute value of x minus a is less than delta. So what would, should we choose for delta? Well, let's set delta equal to epsilon. Then, whenever 0 is less than the absolute value of x minus a is less than delta, which has been set equal to epsilon, we have the absolute value of x minus a is less than epsilon, sure. So that's the end of the proof. Yep, as x goes to a, x goes to a. Similarly, the limit as x goes to a of just a constant k is k. In this case, no matter what you choose for epsilon, you can choose anything you want for delta. You'll always stay within that epsilon unit. 
we need a theorem that allows us to avoid kind of the ugliness of this epsilon delta definition of the limit. And in particular, we'll have the following. Um, let limit as x goes to a of f of x equals l, the limit as x goes to a of g of x equals m. Then, if you take the limit as x goes to a of k times f of x, how does the constant k affect the value of the limit? Well, constants can move out of limits. And so you get k times l. How does the limit process work if you add two functions that have limits, l and m? The answer is you can break the limit up and do the limit of f by itself, do the limit of g by itself, and get L plus M. There's more to this theorem. What if it's minus? Well, should that not be L minus M? What about times? Should not be L times M, provided both of those limits exist. What about the limit as X goes to A of F of X divided by D of X? This one you need to be a little careful about because division has a nasty little problem. You can't divide by zero. Remember, in the, context of, in the context of limits, division by zero means more work. So we can definitely say this, L divided by M provided M isn't zero. More? Why not this? The limit as X goes to A of F of X to the power N is L to the power N. Yes. What about the limit as X goes to A of the square root of F of X? Well, it will be the square root of L provided L is not negative. How does this theorem help us? Suppose we have the limit as x goes to, let's say, 2 of 3x squared plus 4x minus 5. The last theorem tells us we can take the limit of each term separately. because we can distribute a limit across a sum. Now, the last theorem also tells us that if we take the limit of a constant, we get a constant. It tells us that we can move constant factors out of limits. And the limit of a square is a square of the limit.
This constant 4 can be moved out. Now, we already proved that if x goes to a, then x goes to a. So we get 3 times 4 plus 4 times 2 minus 5. 3 times 4 is 12. 4 times 2 is 8. 12 and 8 is 20 minus 5 is 15, and we never had to use an epsilon or a delta. This last example illustrates a broader principle. Because of the theorem, you can evaluate limits of polynomials just by plugging the number in. Simple function evaluation. The function value will be the value of the limit. That's not true for functions generally. What is a polynomial? A polynomial is a finite sum of monomials. Of course, that begs the question, what is a monomial? A monomial is an expression of the form a constant times x to the power n, where n lies in the set of whole numbers. Remember, the whole numbers do include 0, but they don't include negatives. We have then a corollary. What is a corollary? A corollary is a theorem that is an immediate consequence of another theorem. It goes like this. If p of x is a polynomial, then you can evaluate the limit as x goes to a of that polynomial by simply plugging the number a into the function p. Keep in mind, this is not true for all functions, and you've seen some for which this is not true. But for polynomials, it always works. For example, if I have the limit as x goes to 3 of 4x squared minus 10, then what I get is 4 times 3 squared minus 10. You just plug it in. It's that simple. 3 squared is 9 times 4 is 36. And so the answer for this limit is 26. Aren't theorems great? Theorems help us do things efficiently and easily. That's what a good theorem does. You should thank your lucky stars for all these wonderful theorems. The alternative would be to calculate the limit using the definition. Given epsilon greater than zero, you have to find a delta, which is a function of epsilon, etc., etc. This allows us to avoid the nastiness and get right down to essentials. To illustrate the idea in the next theorem, suppose I have two functions. I have the function f, which has a hole and maybe a point displaced, perhaps. And I have a function g, which has exactly the same shape, except at x equals a. So in our next theorem, we're going to suppose that f of x equals g of x except at x equals a. And we're also going to suppose that as x tends to a, g of x tends to some number l.
The only thing different about these two functions is the value at x equals a. But limits specifically ignore what happens at x equals a. So the limit of f should give you the same value. This has important consequences for calculating certain limits. For example, consider the function f of x, which is x squared minus 1 over x minus 1. We've already looked at this one before. We can kind of group the factors in this way. Everywhere except that x equals 1, x minus 1 over x minus 1 is 1. Consider a function which cancels out the common factor. This function g will exactly equal the function f, except at x equals 1. But the limit as x goes to 1 of g will be 2, because it's a polynomial. And you evaluate the limit by simple function evaluation. That implies from the last theorem that the limit as x goes to 1 of x squared minus 1 over x minus 1 is also 2. That justifies canceling out common factors, numerator and denominator, when evaluating limits. Let me give you another example. Suppose I'm taking the limit as x goes to, say, 2 of x cubed minus 8 over x minus 2. How should this work? If you plug in x equals 2, 2 cubed is 8. 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. Minus 8 is 0. 2 minus 2 is 0. You get 0 divided by 0. What does that mean in the context of limits? That's right. That means more work. So what is the extra work? The extra work requires that we can the factor of x minus 2. That's equivalent to dividing it into the factor above, which we can do by either long division or synthetic division. This gives us an opportunity to review both processes. If I'm dividing x minus 2 into x cubed minus 8, I need to multiply by x squared. That gives me an x cubed minus 2x squared, which we subtract. x cubed minus x cubed cancels. 0x squared minus negative 2x squared gives me a 2x squared. That means we have to add 2x next. Multiplying, we get 2x squared minus 4x, which we must subtract. 2x squared minus 2x squared cancels. There are no x's. Minus negative 4x gives me 4x. At this point, I'll carry down the minus 8. We then have to add 4. Multiplying, we get 4x minus 8, and that gives us a remainder of 0, which means this exactly looks like the limit as x goes to 2 of x squared plus 2x plus 4. And the value there is going to be 2 squared, which is 4, plus 2 times 2, another 4, that gives you 8, plus 4, gives you 12. But let's try this division process using synthetic division instead. Synthetic division has you take the root of the denominator, which is 2. 2 is what you have to plug into the denominator to get 0. On the top, you take the coefficients, including the 0 coefficients for the terms that, aren't, that don't appear up there. So there's a 1x cubed a 0x squared, a 0x, and a minus 8. Here's how this works. Bring the 1 down. 
multiply and then add. So you multiply and then add. You get a 2. Multiply and then add. 2 times 2 is 4 plus 0 is 4. Multiply and then add. That's the remainder. These are the coefficients 1, 2, and 4 of the quotient. The quotient being 1x squared plus 2x plus 4. This gives you the same thing as the long division process, just a lot faster. We will look more at the epsilon delta definition at the end of this chapter, but we're going to ignore the fine details of the rest of the theory for now, other than to develop some other theorems. We want to talk about one-sided limits. We want to allow a function to have different limits from the left and the right, and perhaps a different function value. We want to talk about the limit as x goes to a from the right. Suppose that's l and the other limit is m. And the limit as x goes to a from the left. A superscript of plus means from the right, and a superscript of minus means from the left. To make these definitions more carefully, let's consider the limit from the right. What happens if x is just to the right? In defining the concept of the limit as x goes to a from the right of f of x equals l, we have to let epsilon greater than 0 be given in the range. There will exist a delta greater than 0 in the domain. In this case, we don't want to look to the left. We only want to look to the right. So we want to have this so that x minus a a is positive, so that x is bigger than a, but the distance is less than delta. Then the function value in L are two within epsilon units. That's what this sequence of symbol means precisely. If you want to go from the left, all you have to do is arrange it so that the inequality here goes the right way. So to define the limit as x goes to a from the left equals m, again, given one greater than 0, that gives you some measure of closeness in the range. There exists delta greater than zero. In this case, we want to include everything from below a delta units up to a, but specifically ignore what happens to the right, such that if, let's see, how do we want to do this? Zero is less than a minus x is less than delta. That way, if x is less than a, a minus x will be positive. But we can't let that distance get to be more than delta. So being within the, this closeness on the left gets you to within that epsilon neighborhood in the range. For example, Suppose we have the limit as x goes to 0 of the absolute value of x over x. This function takes on a value of 1 provided x is positive. When x is positive, the absolute value does nothing. So you're taking a number and dividing it by itself. When x is negative, 
The numerator will be positive, the bottom negative, but of the same magnitude. So if we take the limit as this limit will not exist. If we take the limit as x goes to 0 from the right, you're approaching from the right. You have to get 1. When we take the limit as x goes to 0 from the left, you're approaching from the other side, and you get minus 1. The one-sided limits both exist, but they're different, and hence the limit itself does not exist. There must be some connection between the difference in one-sided limits and this limit not existing. The theorem goes like this. If the limit as x goes to a from the right of f of x equals L, and that's also the limit as x goes to a from the left, then the limit as x goes to a exists and equals the common value L. If the one-sided limits both exist and equal some number L, then the limit itself exists and equals L. Also, If these two limits, one-sided limits, are not equal, then the limit as x goes to a of f of x does not exist. Let's look at a quick example. Let's suppose our function looks like x minus 1 when x is less than 0. It looks like x squared minus 1 for x values between 0 and 1. And it looks like 3x plus 2 for x values greater than or equal to 1. I guess we can look at what this function looks like. For negative x values, it looks like a straight line with a slope of 1 and an intercept of minus 1. Not including at x equals 0. From x equals 0 to x equals 1, we have a piece of a parabola opening up, but with a vertical translation down one unit. That fills this dot, because at x equals 0, we have a y value of negative 1. But we're going to leave open the dot at x equals 1. For x values bigger than 1, or equal to 1, we have a straight line with a slope of 3 and an intercept of 2. So if the intercept is 2, you go up 3, over 1, and then continue to go up 3 over 1, we have this line, uh, this ray. This function is defined piecewise. There are three little pieces. The domain has been sliced into three parts. On the first part, it's a line. On the second part, it's a parabola. On the third part, it's a straight line. Now, on each of these pieces, the function is a polynomial, so limits on the interior points of these pieces of domain can be evaluated by simple function evaluation. The only question is, what happens at the endpoints? You can see that the limit as x goes to 0 from the left for this function to the left of 0, you have to use x minus 1. And that being a polynomial, you can just plug, plug the 0 in and get minus 1. And the limit as x goes to 0 from the right 
To the right of zero, you have to use the quadratic. But that too is a polynomial, and so you can evaluate the limit by simple function evaluation. Because the left limit and the right limit exist, we deduce that the limit as x goes to zero of this function exists and is equal to one. And you can see that on the graph. Let's look at what happens at one. In the limit as x goes to one from the left, to the left of one, you have to use x squared minus one. x squared minus 1 being a polynomial, you just evaluate and get 0. And the limit as x goes to 1 from the right, to the right of 1, you have to use 3x plus 2. And that gives you 5. As you approach 1 from the left, you get a height of 0. As you approach 1 from the right, you get a height of 5. You can see then that the limit as x goes to 1 of f of x does not exist. Let's try a quick example. The limit as x goes to 1 of the square root of x minus 1 over x minus 1. You can see that if you just substitute 1 into the numerator and denominator, you end up with 0 over 0, and you know what that means. More work. What is the additional work in this case? If you said multiply numerator and denominator by the conjugate of the numerator, you're right. Did you hear that? Multiply both numerator and denominator by the conjugate of the numerator. You have to multiply both, otherwise you're changing the value of the expression. We get the limit as x goes to 1. When we FOIL out the top, root x times root x is just x. We'll have a positive root x and a negative root x, which cancels out. And that leaves minus 1. We're still over x minus 1, root x plus 1. The x minus cancel, leaving a, just a 1 in the numerator. Now as x goes to 1, you get the square root of 1, which is 1, plus 1 is 2 in the denominator. And so the answer is 1 half. This computation used that theorem where f is equal to g except at a, where you can calculate the limit of f and then apply that to g or vice versa. We could cancel the x minus 1 after rationalizing the numerator. Before looking at the next example, I want to talk about number sets. In particular, note that the natural numbers is denoted by a blackboard bold n. The natural numbers include 1, 2, 3, and so on. That's about as small a number set as we are going to consider. Then there are the whole numbers, which include a zero. The discovery of zero being an important milestone in mathematics. After that, we have the integers. These are the integers. Now, why do we use a blackboard bold Z 
to represent the integers. Well, it turns out that the German word for integers is Zahlen. The Germans invented the notation, and so we just go along with it. After the integers, we have the rational numbers. That's the set of all p divided by q, such that p and q are elements of the set of integers, and q is not 0, i.e. the fractions. Every number that can be expressed as the ratio of two integers is called a rational number. And you thought a rational number was a number that talks and makes sense. The set of rational numbers is strictly larger than the set of integers. And that contains the whole numbers and that contains the natural numbers. So we're building up bigger and bigger number sets. So what's next? The next largest number set that we are going to consider are the real numbers, denoted by a blackboard bold R. Now, you're not ready for a technical definition of the real numbers. Suffice it to say that the real numbers are numbers that have a decimal representation. The next number set up are the complex numbers they're the set of all x plus i y such that x and y are real and i is the principal square root of negative one well wait a minute where are the irrational numbers in this discussion? As you know, the rational numbers have either a repeating decimal or a terminating decimal, which actually ends in a repeating sequence of zeros. Irrational numbers have non-repeating decimals. So they're all real numbers except the rationals. By the way, you should know that the first irrational number was discovered by Hippasus of Metapuntum. Hippasus. Hippasus was a Pythagorean. He was in the Pythagorean society in Pythagoras, in Pythagoras's original community in Crotona, in the boot of Italy. By the way, Pythagoras was born in Samos, an island along the coast of Turkey. Hippasus, the Pythagoreans had a peculiar philosophy. Pythagoras taught that if you study anything deeply enough, and the Greeks were always interested at the core element of existence. If you study anything deeply enough, you will arrive at a question of proportion between whole numbers, i.e. a fraction. Everything, when you study deeply enough, ends up in a fraction. So the fractions became an important element of the way that the Pythagoreans understood the universe, their cosmology. For instance, Pythagoras taught that the various celestial objects were on crystal spheres. And you didn't see the crystal sphere because it's crystal. And that's the reason the planets seem to go around in the night sky at different rates. They're on these crystal spheres that are spinning and turning. He taught that these different, different crystal spheres have different radii, and those radii are in the proportions of the musical notes, which also Pythagoras invented. He invented the musical scale by dividing a string into fractions. 
The musical scale that you know is due to Pythagoras. He taught that these crystal spheres have these nice radii proportions that lead to a harmony, the harmony of the spheres. This understanding of fractions being at the root of everything was core to the Pythagorean philosophy. But Hippasus proved that the square root of two cannot be expressed as a ratio of two integers. This proof is simple enough. It's clearly understandable by the ancient Pythagoreans, but it clearly contradicted their understanding of the entire universe. So what do you think they did to poor Hippasus? Well, there are several myths about what happened to poor Hippasus of Metapontus. One is that the Pythagoreans took him on a one-way fishing trip into the Mediterranean. So another is that they desecrated his grave after he died. And a third is that before he died, they erected a tomb for him and desecrated it so that he could see his own tomb being desecrated before he died. Whatever the case may be, what is clear is that Hippasus's theorem, his proof that the square root of two cannot be expressed as the ratio of two editors, was upsetting to the Pythagorean cosmology. So if you're angry at the Pythagoreans, don't be too angry. After all, it turns out that the king of Samos wanted to be a Pythagorean. Now, there were two levels of membership. There were the Mathematicoi, who ate a vegetarian diet and lived on the Pythagorean campus. And there were the Acousmatics, who lived off of the campus and commuted in for learning. Now, the Mathematicoi became quite powerful because they were smart and they became influential in the city, and the king wanted to tap into this. But Pythagoras refused. So it's said that the king of Crotona came in and killed 90 members of the Pythagorean society, and that Pythagoras fled. But either being distraught or being chased and murdered, somehow he did not meet a natural end. He either killed himself out of despair or was tracked down and killed. Now, one fact you may not know about rational and irrational numbers is that between every two rational numbers, there is an irrational number. Okay, and also, between every two irrational numbers, there is a rational number. Which means that the rationals and irrationals are interwoven. Between these two rationals, there's an irrational. And between these two irrationals, there's a rational. So they're all woven in between each other. Now I want you to consider the following example. It's called the Dirichlet discontinuous function. It's defined as follows. Suppose x is 0. Suppose f of x is 0. If x is irrational and 1 if x is rational. 
Let's see what this function looks like. At the irrational numbers, we output a height of 0. But at the rational numbers, we output a height of 1. But the rationals and irrationals are interwoven. So at the irrationals, we get 0. And at the rationals, we get 1 where they're going back and forth. If I choose any number a, whether rational or irrational, and try to take the limit as x goes to a for this function, this limit cannot exist. And that's because no matter what epsilon you choose, if you choose a small epsilon around 1, no matter what delta you choose, there will be both rational and irrational numbers inside of this interval. And the function will have function values down here 0, not inside of this epsilon neighborhood, which means that the limit can't possibly exist. So what's interesting about this function is that no matter what point in the domain you choose, and it's defined everywhere, its domain is the entire real line because every real number is either rational or rational. At every point in the domain, this function does not have a limit. The limit does not exist. It's too busy oscillating back and forth, up at 1 and down at 0, up at 1 and down at 0. We can amend this function just a little bit and make it have a limit at one point. Consider the following function. Suppose the function outputs x for x rational and negative x for x irrational. The graph of this function looks like y equals x for the rational function, rational numbers, and y equals negative x for the irrational numbers. You can see that this function will only have limits at You can see that this function will only have a limit as x approaches 0. In the limit as x approaches 0 for this function, the y values get squished down to 0. But in the limit as x goes to a, where, where a is not 0, the limit does not exist. So this limit. So this function only has a limit at one point, and everywhere else, the limit doesn't exist.